Hello everyone, welcome to this FMB webinar um, brought to you today by the Federation of Master Builders. You're very welcome and thank you for joining us. My name is Hayley Lorimer, I'm Director of Membership Services at the FMB and I'm delighted to have a panel of knowledgeable people to share their expertise and experience with you today. I'm sure you're going to find it useful, all on the topic of becoming a small um, property developer. So today's webinar is based around the Construction Leadership Council Guide to Becoming a Small Property Developer. Um, and if you haven't already looked at that document, it is downloadable from the FMB website and it's packed with information. It's a really good read. That's not a sales pitch. I'm not getting any royalties out of that, but it, it, um, I'm sure you will find that document useful if you haven't looked at it already. Before I hand over to our first speaker, just a bit of housekeeping to go through for you. So we will be sending you a follow up email in the next day or so after the webinar, which will have copies of the slides, a link to the recording of the webinar, um, and I think a link through to the website where you can download that guide if you haven't got it already, and any, any other information that might be useful. So you don't have to worry about making a note of everything if we go through, because you will, as we go through, because you will get that email. Um, and if you want to respond to that with any suggestions for future webinar topics that we might cover, that that would be brilliant. We always like to get those as well. So this webinar should uh, take about 40, 45 minutes or so to go through the presentation and with a Q&A session with our panel at the end as well. Um, if you have any questions as we go through the um, session, just type them into the Q&A box that you can see at the bottom of the screen, and we will share those at the end of the session, give the speakers a chance to answer them. And please remember that there is no such thing as a daft question. If you're thinking of a question, there probably is another person in the audience who is too, so do um, put your questions in there. So um, our speaker... Speaker today, our first speaker is the author of this report, that uh, the guide that I've been referring to is Andrew Dixon, who is a policy consultant who works in this sector and is also um, an old friend of the FMB, having been our head of policy previously, so has a lot of experience of uh, SME builders and the issues that they face. Um, after that, we'll also have Chris Carr, who's the chair of this Construction Leadership Council SME housing subgroup, which is quite a lot to get your mouth around, um, and also the National v Vice President of the FMB, among many other roles that Chris has, and he's joining us today as well, as well as running his old bu own building company, Car and Car Builders Limited. And we have John Slaughter, who's Director of Industry Affairs at the Home Builders Federation, who's also joining us today. And the HBF represents and serves new home builders and developers of, of all sizes. So we're um, running this event today as a collaborative event between our associations. So I'm now going to hand over to Andrew to begin his presentation and I will disappear off your screen. And don't forget to put questions into the Q&A box as you go along. Thank you. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Hayley. Um, and, and, and hi, everybody. Um, great to be here this afternoon and uh, really looking forward to uh, this webinar and to the, the questions and the conversation that follows. Let me just uh, get back to the beginning, uh, which is a good place to start. Um, so uh, here's what um, I'm going to run through uh, this afternoon. I'm going to start off by quickly explaining the purpose of this guide, uh, and then I'm going to talk through some of the key points uh, in the main sections of the report. And I'm going to start by talking about what we've described as, as the fundamentals of development, land, finance and planning, and then look at some key elements in the construction and sales phases and end by touching on uh, some other key considerations and in particular sustainability. Uh, you, you'll see if you've looked at the guide or if you get a chance afterwards, there's, a, there's an awful lot in this guide and there's a danger in this webinar of of skipping too lightly over everything. So in the time that we've got, I'm gonna focus in more detail on those key issues of land, finance and planning. And then in later sessions, just pick out some, some key considerations and issues, which I think it would be most useful to take on board this afternoon. Um, so this guide is intended to be a source of support and guidance for all those considering or, or in the process of becoming 
uh, small developers. What it does is to provide an overview of, of key steps you'll need to take, um, key issues you'll need to consider, but most importantly, it, it brings together a lot of tips and advice from experienced people in the industry. It, what it's not intended to be is a comprehensive guide uh, or a technical manual. On the contrary, it's intended to be relatively easy to, to pick up and read, um, but it does, where necessary, signpost you to further information. Uh, and, and who is this for? Well, guide and this webinar is aimed essentially at prospective small developers, those exploring the idea of moving into the housing development business. Uh, so first time developers or, or very recent startups. Uh, and when writing the guide and thinking about who would be reading it, I guess we were thinking of two typical types of backgrounds uh, of people who might, well, backgrounds that people might be coming from. Uh, and one of these is those already in the construction industry. So small builders and contractors, skilled trade, skilled trades people. Uh, and the other is people who might be seeking to bring professional skills from business or highly relevant expertise in say finance or planning uh, to bear in housing development. Uh, and this distinction can be important. So at this point, I thought it might be useful to ask those of you on this webinar, which, which of these most applies to you. So I think we've got a Zoom poll uh, and, and we're gonna ask, uh, do, do you come from a construction or a non-construction background? Um, so there you go, it's appeared on screen, uh, simple question. Uh, and I'll wait a short while for people to answer it. I think this, this is a, an important distinction though. It's important in terms of pinpointing what you don't know. Uh, and it will impact on the set of expertise you need to bring in and rely on the types of partnerships, new relationships you might need to build. So a small contractor, for instance, might already have strong relationships with, uh, with local merchants uh, and know how to work with them most effectively, but perhaps less so with local planners. So I don't know. I don't... Yep, everybody, uh, almost everybody's answered the poll now. So I will just share the um, result on the screen for everybody to see. Great, thanks, Hayley. Okay, so uh, as I expected, perhaps, but 90% um, of people on this call from from construction background. So that's, that's useful to know. And I can I can bear that in mind in talking through what follows. Uh, so let's get into some of the, the key issues now. Um, Sorry, my, my slides seem to have temporarily frozen, but bear with me a second. There we go. Uh, so let's start with land first. Uh, and this is, this is sometimes uh, one of the hardest parts of the puzzle for small developers and house builders. Small scale developers, uh, by the nature of what they're doing, are looking for quite small sites. Um, those bringing forward their first or second developments, that probably means something between one and five units. Uh, and this, this guide sets out some of the key means and sources of intelligence that small developers use for finding those sites, which you can see here uh, on the left hand side. Now, I'm not going to go through all of those in detail, but I'm going to focus instead on some key pieces of advice here on the right hand side, which relate to these, because depending where, where you are in the country, finding suitable sites of the right size, especially those that have a good chance of getting planning can be a real challenge. Because of this, one of the most important considerations for small developers is, is number one on this list, whether to look to buy a site or a part of a site that already has planning permission. Uh, so this is a typical entry point for, for small developers. This means that um, you'll pay more probably, you'll get a lower return, uh, but you'll, you'll reduce your risks reduce time and complexity of the process that you're going through, but at the same time, you'll be building up your experience. A second key piece of advice, estate agents are a real source of, uh, of knowledge about potential sites. Uh, and the key tip here is to, to find and register with, with good local agents, and especially those who have worked successfully with other small developers and know this market best. Uh, and uh, another key piece of advice here, the experienced developers wanted to get across uh, was uh, that before you make decisions on a site, know and fully understand the site that you're looking at. Now, this, this certainly means undertaking basic groundwork investigations. It means working with architects and planners to understand design or planning challenges that a site might present. And it means understanding the market as well. So that means the market for the types of homes that you're considering building in the precise location that you're considering building them. Getting this wrong, building the wrong types of homes in the wrong location 
and more generally not understanding the site you're looking at can be a trap that first time developers fall into and, and one that can sink a scheme. And all of this really points to the importance of something which we'll come back to on a number of occasions, which is the importance of having access to and bringing into your team good expertise and professional advice, designers, planning consultants in particular, and involving them as early in the process as possible. Uh, and one way of thinking about this is, is that there are three basic questions you need to answer in assessing a site. Uh, one, you know, can you sell in this location? Two, how likely are you to get planning on this site? And three, can you viably build on this site? And in terms of the time and cost that each of those questions entail, that's probably the order that you want to, you want to consider them. Uh, so we can move on to the next fundamental, finance. Uh, and let, let's pause quickly here and I'll, I'll put another question to you. Uh, and I wanted to ask, ha have you had any experience of seeking development finance before? Um, and you can include in that if um, if you've sought finance for a refurbishment development project, say. So I believe we've got another, um, another Zoom poll. And there's a nice follow-up question here as well. If you have done that, what, what was your experience? Was it positive, negative, mixed, not sure? I would say as well, if, if you know of others who have had experience, but you haven't personally, whether that was negative or positive, perhaps you could uh, you could relay that in your answer as well. While the questions are coming in, I, I mean, we could run a whole seminar, a whole course on development finance. Uh, so rather than uh, go into too much detail again, I'm, I've just picked out in the next slide when we get to it, a few key things that someone would know experience of looking for development finance before perhaps needs to be aware of and consider. How are we doing with the questions, with the answers? Yeah, almost everybody's responded now, so I'll end the poll and, and uh, share the answers. There you go. Uh, interesting, okay. So that, that that's quite a significant number of you have had experience of, of looking for uh, that type of development and, and that type of uh, development finance. Uh, and uh, okay, uh, a, lot, a lot of mixed experience, but uh, more positive than negative. That, that's good to see, that's good to see. Um, so in terms of um, some of those key things to be aware of, um, wait for the next slide again, but firstly, lenders won't lend the whole cost of the development. No lender will say, here's, 100% of the finance you need for this project. Uh, different types of lenders will be prepared to lend higher or lower percentages of the cost, but generally the higher the percentage, uh, the higher uh, the leverage, as they say, the higher the cost of, of borrowing will be. Um, and uh, a project will normally be funded therefore from a, a combination of different sources, what's sometimes called a capital stack. And you can see an example of this in the diagram on the right hand side. This will normally include a first charge lender who will take a first claim on the site if anything goes wrong, the developer's equity, and then an intermediate source of finance. Now, secondly, lenders will want the developer themselves. They'll want you to have your own capital at risk, what's sometimes called skin in the game, so that you are fully incentivized to see the project through successfully. In the same vein, it's relatively normal, unfortunately, for lenders to seek extra security in the form of personal guarantees. And the lower the personal equity that a developer has in a project, uh, the more likely that is. And uh, lenders will only lend once planning permission is in place. Uh, so no one will lend to purchase land without planning. Uh, that's just deemed to be too risky. Uh, and they will only lend once the scheme is fully funded. That means that, they, that when they can see that you've got the funds to see the scheme through. Um, and I think it's also useful to understand just what lenders will be looking at when they judge whether they want to finance your scheme. And a, a smaller specialist bank that we spoke to shared with us this three-step process that they go through. The, the first thing they're looking at is you, it's the developer. What's your track record in delivering similar type projects? Uh, this is difficult if you're a first-time developer, but if you are, then they will be looking for clear evidence of transferable skills. So if you're a contractor with experience of building quality homes, that's definitely a transferable skill. But you may also need to show that you've brought in robust planning, sales skills, anything that 
where you may be able, less be less able to show expertise and experience. Next, they're looking at the asset. Can the project be built? Can it be sold? So your costings and the type of assessment that you should have already undertaken on the site, they'll want solid evidence of this, facts and figures. Uh, third, and then thirdly, the finance structure, is it fully funded? Given the cost of buying, building, selling, uh, does the capital stack ensure that the scheme can fully fund itself from start to completion? Um, the guide lists and describes different types of lenders. Everyone, uh, as you can see here on the left-hand side, from high street banks to crowdfunding. Um, and alongside this, there is some clear advice within the guide to bear in mind on some of the key sources of finance mentioned here. So I'm I'm not going to I'm going to touch on some key points here. Uh, firstly, be prepared to look beyond your high street banks. These have traditionally been a source of funding for. Uh, small house builders, the bank that you have your business account with that knows your business best uh, would provide uh, uh, support to uh, to help you grow and move into housing development. That's much less the case now. High street banks do not generally have a big appetite for small scale development finance. It might be worth making an application, but don't be surprised if it's a no. But beyond high street banks, there is quite a healthy ecosystem of different lenders. These include uh, smaller specialist banks. Um, I'm thinking of the likes of United Trust Bank, Close Brothers, Aldermore, if any of those names mean anything. They provide a similar sort of finance to high street banks, but they have a stronger appetite for, and also I think it's fair to say probably a stronger expertise in small scale development finance. However, because of that, they will probably be slightly more expensive. Beyond these, there are a wide range of different lenders, sometimes talked about as uh, tiers, tier two, tier three, tier four, etc. These are essentially a sliding scale of lenders who are prepared to take on higher risk, uh, whether that means lending higher percentages or lending to those with less or no track record. Uh, but they take on these risks by charging successively higher fees, higher rates of interest uh, and, and having more onerous terms and conditions. One key piece of advice here, therefore, is to, to read in detail what those terms are. You need to understand the model the lender is working to and the terms that this can involve. And above all, you need to be clear about what your financial exit strategy would be if things don't entirely go to plan. A third piece of key advice, not surprisingly, find a good broker. Um, in helping to find the right source of finance, type of finance for you uh, in helping to navigate all of this, a good finance broker can be invaluable. Uh, and finally, private equity can play an important role in financing small housing developments. Housing development can provide a nice way of return for private individuals with money to invest who are happy to take on a bit more risk. And you may be able to find those people through your broker or through personal contacts and wider business networks. So moving on to the next fundamental of development planning. Uh, and, and planning can be one of the biggest challenges for small developers. The length of time, sometimes the complexity of the process can often seem disproportionate for quite small scale developments. Uh, now, one way of getting around this is to, as we've already touched upon, to look for so-called oven ready sites, which, which already have permission. Even then, there will be almost certainly some remaining planning hurdles which you need to negotiate. Uh, but for most established developers, planning is, is a necessary hurdle. It's a risk they have to learn to negotiate and a system they, they learn to become familiar with. So the guide provides a useful overview of the planning system. Uh, and you can see here uh, a basic flowchart of a planning application process for a, a small development. I'm not going to go into the detail of that today. You can find that in the guide. And actually one point uh, that's made in the guide is that you don't need to know everything. That's what professionals advising you are there for, in this case, your planning consultant, uh, but knowing how to approach the planning system, understanding the decisions that you need to make, uh, that, that's the key. Uh, so I wanted in this section just to pick out a few key pieces of advice on different stages of that planning application process. Uh, and in this, I'm gonna focus on the early stages beginning from when you're just exploring the possibility of, of a site and an application. So the post-it note here on, on the left-hand side. Um, first, 
get a good architect and a planning consultant. It's no surprise that's one of uh, the most important pieces of advice that uh, experienced developers wanted to get across um, and get them involved as early as possible, uh, especially as a first time developer, having good advice uh, from those who have been there and done it before is, is key. Uh, secondly, you don't need to know a thing, but, but do some homework. A number of small developers we spoke to talked about researching other similar applications uh, to understand what was being accepted, what was being rejected and why. Um, all local authorities now have databases of planning applications, uh, which you can search through online. At the same time as doing that, you'll begin to develop an understanding of local planning policies uh, and a link to the first piece of advice there as well, because in the course of researching other applications, you can spot planning agents and architects who have got a track record of success. Um, then moving on to what's called the pre-application uh, stage, uh, the, uh, the right hand, the post-it note on the right hand side here, um, pre-application discussions are paid for but informal discussions with planning officers about a possible application. And the main piece of advice here is to hold fire on making too many decisions about a site before you've had a pre-app meeting. Uh, there's a lot of reasons why these pre-apps are important, uh, but one key one is that before you've had those discussions, you don't really know how planning officers are going to approach a site uh, and what they might be looking for or not want on a particular site. So there's a danger of getting too far down the road in the design and the application before that pre-app. Uh, and secondly, uh, build constructive relationships with planners. One of the most commonly related pieces of advice was this, was just to, to build good working relationships uh, generally, but particularly with planning officers. Relationships between planners and developers can, uh, can too often become confrontational, but particularly as a small developer and a new developer, uh, that will rarely go well for you. Um, that said, there's a balance here. Uh, and it says in the guide, you should feel able to politely challenge, question, push back on decisions or requests that you don't think are justified or necessary. Uh, and then looking at the application stage, three key pieces of advice here, uh, get your paperwork right. This was something that planning officers we spoke to were particularly keen to point out. They often see applications from small developers that fail this test. Um, it's important that you know uh, the information that you need to provide and that you encourage your consultant to be clear and concise in the information they provide. Inaccurate information, large amounts of irrelevant material, slow down processes, slow down decision making. Um, be prepared for delays. This was a point that experienced developers were pains to get across. Plan planning processes normally take significantly longer than they're meant to on paper. And it's important that you you're prepared for that and that you build in leeway in terms of your projected timelines, costs and cash flow to take account of that. And final piece of advice on planning, be prepared to compromise in the course of the discussions you have with officers, be prepared to compromise on details to help get the decision that you ultimately need. OK, so that's the fundamentals and the middle section of this guide deals with various aspects of what you might describe as Post planning phrases, everything from workforce and skills to buying materials, building control, site management to handover and sales. As I said at the beginning, I don't think it makes sense to touch on all of this today. Uh, and we know most of you have a, a construction background. Um, so I'm going to pass over those areas likely to be more familiar to you and quickly uh, pick out some key pieces of advice on assembling a core team in particular and on sales and handover stages, which may be less familiar. Um, so uh, in the guide, there's information about on building an on-site team, accreditation, skills and training. Um, but three key pieces of advice I think are worth picking out here. W one, assemble your, your core professional team as early as possible. Uh, this has come up a few times now already. Whatever your background, you're going to need to rely on a core team of those with the right professional skill sets to give you the advice you need to navigate the development process. This is, this is a team game. Uh, and that core team, uh, as it's been described here, will include a, a bare minimum, a designer, a planning consultant, an estate agent. You might also need a, a specialist property solicitor, a surveyor, a structural surveyor. 
Uh, and you should be thinking about assembling that core team as early as possible. Uh, in a way, it should be one of the first things that you, you do. Uh, second key piece of advice, uh, and that shouldn't come as a surprise either, uh, put, it's worth putting in the time to find quality tradespeople. If you want your business to succeed and gain a reputation for quality, you'll need to work with tradespeople you can rely on to consistently deliver high quality work. Uh, and thirdly, um, the approach to on-site workforce that you take, your relationship with your on-site workforce might depend on your professional and industry background, but if you're uh, someone who already works as a small builder or contractor, then you will likely have an on-site team or a set of working relationships that you can bring to that. But you will need to concentrate on finding those skills in the housing market, planning and finance that you don't have. Either way, partnerships can make a lot of sense in terms of drawing into your business skills and expertise that you have less sight of. Uh, so let's come to the end of the process now and the sales, marketing and handover side of things. The guide talks through uh, some different sales and marketing techniques, which you can see here uh, in the box on the, on the right hand side, all of which you might choose to use in different ways. I'm not going to run through all of these. Um, one thing I would note, though, is technology has provided uh, a whole range of increasingly important ways of marketing and selling from 3D visualizations to one developer who told me how drone shots would, uh, had proved to be a particularly effective way of engaging customers. What I want to do here quickly is just to pick out some key considerations that you'll need to think through. Um, and uh, the first of these, will you sell off plan? In other words, uh, selling before you start building. So selling off plan means faster returns, lower risks, but if house prices rise fast, or if um, if build costs increase unpredictably, uh, then this can significantly cut your returns. Um, you'll also need to think about uh, how you set up the site. And when you're setting up your site and, and scheduling your, your build stage, you'll need to consider what your customers experience of the site will be when they visit but what stage of the build will you be showing customers around and, and how will the site look at that point thirdly who sells is the person best able to sell your product you or a trusted member of your team or a local agent with years of experience there's no obvious answer to that even if you've never sold before you may be the most passionate most persuasive person about the home you've built or you may not um, and finally in the handover stage how can you ensure the best possible experience for your customers? As a small developer, customer service can be a, a key element in your competitiveness. Uh, you're unlikely to, to be able to compete with larger developers on price. So quality and customer service will be absolutely key to your business's reputation and your ability to compete. Um, and, and alongside all of these issues, the guide also provides an overview of some other key issues and, and possibilities which all small developers need to consider, issues like sustainability, uh, the custom build market, uh, and uh, modern methods of construction. I'm just going to touch very quickly on one of these and some of the key things you might need to consider within sustainability and the zero carbon agenda. Sustainability is something that house builders uh, these days uh, all need to be taking into consideration because of regulations, but also because of what customers expect from their homes. Building regulations across the UK are rapidly moving towards uh, zero carbon standard. Uh, there'll also be a requirement soon for uh, biodiversity net gain on all sites. What the guide does is it gives an overview of uh, what these policies will mean and outlines a number of key sustainability issues, water efficiency, sustainable drainage, uh, which is worth being aware of uh, and changes or potential changes that might be coming down the track. Now, there's a lot of technical complexity there and involved in those, those standards and regulations, um, and there are different types of solutions and technologies which can help you meet them. The key advice which the guide sets out is essentially this. You, you don't need to know everything. You don't need to sweat all the details. It's up to the professionals you employ, designers, planners, to have solutions to technical problems. Uh, and there will be products and services that help you do that. But you do, need enough, you do need to know enough to ask the right questions and to answer more general questions you might get from customers or planners. Uh, and some of those key questions for you internally will be, 
What are the cost implications of building to current or future standards? What are the implications for design and construction? So future standards may require significant changes in construction methods, for instance, and that might be worth thinking about well in advance. And fi finally, there's a fundamental question as to what your business strategy is when it comes to all this. Is it in your commercial interest to be ahead of the game, to be seeking to be beyond sustainability regulations in key respects as part of uh, your marketing strategy, as part of uh, building a, and selling a premium product? That will depend on your assessment of the market for the types of homes that you want to build. Uh, so that's really just, just a whistle stop for essentially of some of the key elements of housing development and some key tips and advice from others in the industry who have been there, uh, been where many of you are now and gone on to become uh, successful uh, small house builders and developers. Excellent. Thank you, Andrew. There's such a lot packed in there uh, and such a lot of food for thought for our members who are thinking of getting into property development and considerations for them to think about. I think as well the, the importance that you emphasise over and again, really, about building up the right team both the trades on site and the professionals as well, is going to be a key challenge because we know that members are already experiencing skill shortages. and But we also know the, the cost of getting it wrong by not having the right people in place can be very high, can't it? So, yeah, lots of things for people to think about there. Um, I wanted to remind everybody that there's a Q&A box at the bottom of the screen. So if you have any questions, do pop them in there. And I'd like to bring in uh, Chris Carr and John Slaughter now, if they want to put their cameras and microphones on. Chris, first of all, um, is there anything you'd like to add to what Andrew's uh, presentation was getting across? No, I think he, it's a fantastic presentation. I mean, I've known Andrew for many years, and one of the reasons we asked Andrew to, to draw up this um, booklet is because of his expertise in the industry. I mean, this has come from, the, the detail has come from developers, and it's the developers from four or five trade associations, from the HBF, FMB, LABC, MHBC, a full cluster of, uh, uh, of builders got together to put their ideas down. And, and I think the common thing was what we'd like to know before we set off. Um, and I think this is where we're putting all the, all the mishaps we, we went through and then trying to get this so it doesn't, you know, so we don't have to repeat the same thing over again. But yeah, it's a great report, Andrew. Really appreciate it. And so really appreciate everyone that's fed into it. Great. John, anything to add? Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Hayley. Um, I, I just want to give a little bit of wider context, maybe. I mean, I, I agree it's a fantastic guide and uh, it's brilliant that it's been built up by people working in the sector to, to pass on the advice they think is helpful. So we really do help. hope, hope it helps. Um, but this comes from a kind of wider context. Construction Leadership Council is a collaborative forum for the whole construction sector to work on solutions to challenges and, and problems and improve um, future performance and outcomes. And uh, it was galvanised in uh, 2020 by the pandemic, um, restructured, and we set up a housing work stream. And uh, we involved um, the FMB, the HBF and others, as Chris has said in, in that uh, discussion. And we looked at what are the things we think between us are important. And one of the things that came out most strongly was helping more SMEs to come into the housing sector and to be successful and to grow, because we all recognise the benefits that has for the sector as a whole. So I think it's a really good example of how when the industry recognises a shared interest uh, and a shared challenge, it can come together and provide something that's substantive and useful. And uh, we really hope it helps you on the webinar today and others who look at it in the future to, to, to start your journey successfully into the industry, which is a great industry. Uh, everybody I know that works in it sticks with it. So we hope you do too. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you, John. Thanks, everyone. So, yeah, I mean, I, I had a question that was occurring to me as I was listening to Andrew speak, and it might be an impossible question to answer. But um, given that there is higher risk involved in development than in a lot of our members' bread and butter work, which might be extensions, home improvements, refurbishments, that kind of thing, there's presumably higher return on investment that goes alongside that. 
is it possible to quantify what that looks like or does it vary so much from project to project that it's not possible to say um, what that might look like? But I guess that's the reason for wanting to go into it is that it makes your business more sustainable because you're getting a better return on the investment. I think on, on that one, um, if you're being a successful tradesperson, that's what we're kind of, the people are kind of aiming for, you'll have had some money behind you and you'd have probably worked with developers before. I mean, the idea of this is, again, is to take not all the risk out, but take a, a, a large percentage of the risk out. But if you want to do kind of more risk-free, look at, uh, on your online and see where the local custom build or self-build sites are. And if you can find a custom and self-build site, that is a, a site with all the, all the infrastructure in the roads and sewers and all the services. And potentially, it's actually got somebody there that wants to have a house built. You just can't yeah. find someone to build it. So that's the option, the easy option, is to go on there, build for somebody else and get stage payments through it. Secondly, on a custom build and self-build site, the actual regulations say small builders can build off those sites and build them as, a, uh, as an individual company. So most people think a custom and self-build is for an individual person. Actually, small builders can actually get uh, land off there. There should be a list on, on your local authority's websites if you ask for the custom and self-build. They also, on the... It's government legislation. They have to have a list of people that register to be a custom and self build client. So you might end up with some land and a client ready to go. So then you're eliminating a lot of the, the risk. As you go on, it could be more speculative. So then you can start buying a piece of land and then go right. Okay, then I'm going to buy one plot, two plots. Um, but I would start off if you if you if you really want to give it a, a try before you buy almost is look at a custom build site or a site where the opportunity with the customer already there and, and take stage payments. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So questions are coming through. Um, so Carl has asked about software or tools that you might recommend to make it easier to find uh, land. He's heard of one called Land Insight. Are there any others that came up in the course of producing the guide that, that developers have mentioned? Websites to find parcels of land, I guess. Andrew, do you want to do that or shall I? I mean, Land Insight did come up. I don't think the guide lists any particular uh, sites or apps. Um, you'd probably be in a better position to to speak to that, Chris. I, the trouble with the, the Land Insight one, and it's a great example of everybody be using it, try and think outside the box. Uh, look at your local authority. They should have a strategic, hand, st strategic housing land availability assessment in their website. That, that is land that's been put forward for planning. Uh, and it can be small sites, it can be small units of one or two, uh, sorry, small bits of land for one or two units. Try and think outside the box. You go to the bigger ones online, everybody's doing it. Go to local authorities, see what land's available. Speak mm -hmm. to local authority. They have parcels of land that sometimes they're desperate to get rid of, brownfield sites especially, that might get one or two units on there. And then if you're interested, ask them if they want to do a joint venture with you. So they do a deferred payment on your land. So you can take the land off the council, develop it, Get the finance for development, but the land will claim the ownership of the local authority and then do a joint venture at the end where you, you, you split the profits. So actually use the, the, the local authorities for your land purchase and your finance. And that would be done more through the elected members. Get the details from the officers, but actually get them to elected members, you know, your, your, your local councils and say, actually, we found this bit of land. We want to develop it in partnership with you. What's the, you know, what's the opportunities? So that there is different types of doing it that way than rather going through the, the formal. And then the other easy one is obviously your local estate agents. Register with every single estate agent in your area saying you are looking for land or you're looking for properties with large parcels of land that you may be able to build, get the property, flip it straight away and just hide the land off. That's the way of going forward. Brilliant. Yeah, Thank I you. think and local authorities are good source of information i agree and you've got you've got brownfield registers um and it links back to your previous answer on custom build i think as well chris in that you know local authorities have to be making clear where they're looking to provide and how they're trying to meet custom build demand so i think um, there are quite a few sources of information right we, we've got another webinar coming up on the 14th of february with speakers from the brownfield institute and we're going to be talking on that topic of finding brown site, brownfield sites specifically, which might be helpful for members. And information about the future webinars that we're running will come out to everybody in the follow-up email as well. In the meantime, there's another question here. I was wondering this as well. So how do you earn an income 
whilst you're carrying out a development? Do you just build your own salary into the development costs so that it's covered by the finance? Or obviously everybody's got to keep paying the bills in the duration of time it might take to do, to do the development project. So does anybody want to take that? Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah it, you've got to have a little bit of, I say you've got the money behind you, you've got to be willing to, um, I mean, it, it's a as a tradesperson, you wouldn't be doing it. So, for example, I'm a, well, I'm a joiner, but if you're a bricklayer, you wouldn't be sat around the site doing nothing while the brickwork's all being done. So you would go and do your own work, and then you would only kind of literally do whatever your speciality is on the actual builds. So you wouldn't be sat around manager. Your first couple of units, two or three units, you're not going to get a management fee out of it. You're going to have to generate that management fee from coming after two or three units to, to fund the rest of it. To, you do it on a full-time basis you've got to be aware that you're gonna to have to carry on working it's just you can't just stop being a tradesperson and go to be a developer you're gonna to have to work uh hand in hand and then until it becomes commercially viable to just run the business as it, as it is okay yeah, yeah i mean i mean Sorry, well i was just going to again reiterate on the custom build point um, which would help to some extent because um, that's, that's a market that operates on staged payments, as Chris said earlier, and that, that can help with cash flow. So that could be a good way in initially to keep that cash flow flowing yeah. until the first yeah. couple of projects are done. Okay, thanks for that. So um, someone else has asked a question about brownfield sites specifically, which are more expensive to develop because of the requirements to produce soil reports um, and because coming out of the ground can be quite high risk. How do you suggest minimising exposure to risk in that situation? That might be another question uh, for the Brownfield Institute at our 14th of February webinar. Um, we'll be you know, running that, but it, does anybody have any response to that in the meantime? Right. Minimising right. risks? I, I do build on some small brownfield sites and you're right, it, it, it can be a bit of a nightmare. I think what the HBF and the FMB do in a challenging government on this, because they want to see these brownfield sites uh, being brought forward, but then they're putting the onerous uh, uh, um, section 106s against these properties uh, and also the biodiversity net gain uh, is going to go on brownfield sites, which is proportionally just horrendous for a, a small brownfield site, has more biodiversity in it in existence than it does on a a 2000 unit greenfield site because there's no biodiversity in there. It's a plowed up field. We've got to get the government to, to look at the brownfield sites and look at ways we can that can help us with it. And I think uh, with webinar, Haley, it's one of those things we need to push. Um, it is a problem. Uh, it's, I don't know what the solution is. On ours, we were lucky that we have finance in the business to eradicate a lot of the problems and we still make a small return on it, but not as much return as on a, on a greenfield site. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's tricky. I mean, I think um, it, it either needs, in, otherwise, it needs incentives, or um, I suppose, um, Chris. I mean, is it is it feasible in practice um, when you're planning to sort of put these issues to the local authority in terms of um, other planning contributions they're looking for? Are they willing to? Are they willing to be a bit flexible in these kind of situations in practice? What's your What's your experience of that? I mean, most of ours were under 10 units, so the 106 contributions, uh, which uh, people know the section 106 is the kind of, um, where, where builders were always accused of backhanding the local authorities to get planning. This is a legal way they do it now. They education, social housing. Um, so there are exceptions on brownfield sites which can make it more commercially viable. There is, if you do for the 106, actually you can prove the um, commercial viability. So you can prove, make 20% make less than 20 percent they can reduce the 106s down so you still mm -hmm. make uh, still make a margin but if there's no 106 it's still not commercially viable um then you are looking at a bit of trouble then you then you go to local yeah. authority see if there's actually any funding there from some of the um, development sites from the larger uh, strategic sites you know the, the, the volume house builder sites uh, if they've put money to one side to help uh, remediate uh, brownfield sites in the area so you ask the question or ask is that development coming ahead from barracks for a thousand units? Can you put in something there that we could have some section 106 money of theirs to help uh, on a brownfield site deliver in the centre of the town? Mm. Okay. I think I think this all goes back to the importance of the the site appraisal 
that you do at the beginning of the process as, as well, Haley. That you know, if it, getting that right is absolutely kind of vital to minimising your risks because, yeah. and we talked about um, you know understanding the site. Um, that that helps to understanding planning policies around developer contributions. Chris talked about section one hundred and six, community infrastructure levy. All the understanding very clearly what developing a particular site is going to cost you um, it, it is really key to to kind of that 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 initial decision and, and making sure you're not taking on undue risk and exposing yourself unnecessarily. Mm. Okay, well, we've been going for 45 minutes or so. Oh, there's another question just popped in there. So uh, Barry's asked, hi, I assume there is a tax on the profit from, say, five units. How does that work? Or oh, the taxation associated with all of this sounds like another webinar all of its own, I think. Um, so I, does anyone want to jump in with that? I can try to, uh, I can try to explain that, Hayley. So, um, most um most development is subject to some kind of what's called in in a generic general sense developer contributions so that includes all these different charges uh section 106 community infrastructure levy uh section 106 for affordable housing purposes isn't levied on sites of less than 10 units uh so that you know mo most um most new developers building at a fairly small scale won't won't hit that threshold um in in their in their first de development or two um but uh but but most most developments will be subject to some kind of charges by local authorities and these are used to fund public goods um it, you know it, essentially they're a way of um uh local uh, of, of government taking back some of the increase in the value of the land that results from giving it planning permission that's that's what's that's what's going on there um but you you know you you need to be very clear as to what uh as to what those taxes are uh, and your your planning consultant again will be key to uh helping you talk that through and your your pre-application discussions that you hold with planning officers as well will be important in in terms of clarifying what the costs on this site will what they what those taxes uh which is what they amount to on the site will be okay You're right it's the it's the pre-application you ask them and ask them in writing to put down what the contributions will be for this site. Great. Well, I think we'd better draw that to a close um, now. As I've already mentioned, you will everybody will receive a follow-up email after this, which will have the dates of the upcoming webinars, two of which are linked to uh, property development in terms of the one with the Brownfield Institute, which is coming up on the 14th of February, and another one that we have with uh, BT Openreach, who are going to be talking about the gigabit legislation and connectivity for new homes, which is on the 31st of January. So um, anyone attending who's interested in those and would like to attend, just let us know. And if you have any questions that have arisen today that you haven't had a quest, uh, chance to ask, then by all means respond to the email that you'll receive with that question and we'll do our best to uh, forward it on to the relevant speaker so that they can get in touch and give you an answer to that. I hope it's been useful today. I'm sure it has. There's been an awful lot of information and it seems to me like a brilliant idea for our existing current members to be able to learn from the experiences of, of members who've already been through these processes and um, no doubt learned from things that have gone wrong and pitfalls to avoid, which is always great. And that's part of the purpose of the Federation of Master Builders, of course, is to share that knowledge and expertise between members. So thank you very much to our speakers today, to Andrew, Chris and John for being with us and giving up their time. And thank you to everybody else for attending. And goodbye. Thank you. Bye.